Well, good morning, everybody. It is Thursday, and I've got a date with you. If you're watching a little bit later, hello and welcome. Um, it's chilly. Yeah, it's seriously chilly. I actually had to run and go and put on like another like, like long sleeve, like something like. And, and I'm not like into long sleeves, so I feel like I'm in a bit of a straight jacket. Um, so I might like strip naked or something halfway through this. But but anyway, we're not going to go there. Um, <clears throat> might frighten you all away forever. But um, guys, it's a chilly winter, isn't it? Um, I I very rarely wear two jerseys. Very very rarely, like a. a, a a jersey or like a thin jersey and then like a jacket because I have this issue with like <coughs> being strangled and uh, this morning was one of those five o'clock this morning it was freezing and I believe in some parts of the country it was minus three minus eight um, it's been cold um, if your pansies are in the garden by now this morning they would have had these little little icicle sparkles around them um, and those summer tropicals that you had planted that might have been left in the garden like some coleus mine are looking so miserable um i walk past them and i say to them today you're going today you are going but i just i, I just haven't had the heart to make them go you know to compost heaven um but so those of you who did have any of those or some impatience left um, from the summer that were kind of hanging in there, like, I think they're gone. I think they're officially gone. But uh, guys, it's okay because sometimes we need a bit of a kick in the right direction and to get us going and to make sure that we are getting in the right colour and there's nothing, nothing as good as Mother Nature um, to tell us, Tanya, it is time. So, uh, here we are. It is winter. It's June. There are those winds. And I, it, oh. do you, you know what I think gets to me is the darkness. It's the darkness. Um, you get up, it's dark. You get home from work, it's dark. <laughs> Everything is dark. <laughs> And yet the days are so beautifully glorious by 10 o'clock, half past 10, you're like stripping, baby, get it off. Um, and in fact, here in KwaZulu-Natal, believe it or not, we have more sunshine in winter than we do in summer. Sunny days. Weird, eh? And for those of you that live up there near Nelspruit, um, all of those beautiful subtropical areas, you'll experience exactly the same because here during the summers it's just rain and rain and mist and rain and mist and rain and mist. Um, but guys, how felt? Beautiful days, gorgeous, gorgeous days. Um, oh, and the sardine run is on. Have you seen? Man, you know, some people take their annual leave. My dad used to take his annual leave. But he insisted and he told his boss it was flexi leave. So he would take it like during this period now. And of course they'd have scouts from, but there were no cell phones in those days. It was like, do you know, get to a ticky box. Do you remember those things? Some of you won't. It was blue and it had numbers. And when you push it, it went beep, beep, beep. Um, and you could probably phone someone for like 20 cents. Oh, I'm showing my age. Yo. Um, but then that's how it happened, guys. It happened like that. Um, and that's how people communicated. And the world has become so, so very small. So, so very small. And back to the sardine run, my dad would take flexi leave. So it would be like, he'd, he'd like literally walk in one morning and tell his boss, um, I'm going today. And like, well, dad, you couldn't argue with my father. Uh, he was a, a short piece of dynamite. Um, uh, oh, they were pointing at me saying, ah, ha, 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 ha. yes, I know the apple didn't fall far from the tree, guys. Um, in fact, it's a very good gan Granny Smith apple. But anyway, today we're here to talk about fruit trees and talking about how the world has become so small. Um, back, back, back in the days, before we had shops that begin with a W, um, we used to hunt for food. It was actually how plants became part of our lives. We would hunt and gather, hunt and gather for food. 
So plants that had fruit, um, that bore berries or had a nut, were what was seeped out way back to, it's dated back to the Persians. The Persians. We're talking BC, BB, BC. BBC, no, no, BC. Um, right back to Cleopatra's days. And um, there are, there are, are, are hieroglyphics, there are on the, on the murals of, of people walking with, with baskets of, of fruit. And that's where some of it started. In fact, some of the best seed was taken to the tombs. Much like wives and other faithful people. But anyway, we won't go there. Um, the point is that it, it's been with us for so long. In the 1800s, when people had ships, not with engines, but then they started going all around, and, and that's when plants started moving across waters, but taking months. You know, they didn't just pop in a plane and go to New York for the day. It took years, and these plants lived in the most horrid conditions, getting from one continent to the other, and that led to the spread of beautiful fruit trees. Today, well, we just pop down to our local builders and pick up a plant <laughs> in our car. We don't even need a wagon. Um, and yeah, we just go down and say, I'm looking for a peach or I'm looking for an orange or a kumquat and, uh, or a mango. And we pop it in our car and off we go home. And we don't even blink an eyelid to think about from whence it came. Way back in the beginning. Um, and uh, sometimes I think we need to just take a moment to, to reflect on that. And for me today and, and where we are in our lives at the snapshot, um, it's very personal and very poignant to me right now. Um, and there was a quote I read on Sunday afternoon which said, the greatest, the greatest asset or contribution that any person can do to mankind is to discover a plant by Thomas Jefferson. Lovely, eh? Nice, nice. Stuff that makes my heart clop, sewer, and makes my eyes well up because I've got something stuck in them. No. Um, guys, let's see who's, who's here this morning. Um, if you haven't attempted this fruit tree thing, Come on, come on, come on. you got to give it a go. you got to give it a go. Um, I have uh, at the top in the, in the veggie garden, um, which is probably about 200 meters from here, where the veggie garden is and where my tunnels are for my succulents, we've got calamondins and kumquats um, growing. And um, when I'm feeling a bit hungry and I don't want to come all the way down to the house, and I'm like, I really need something. Like, I think I'm going to fall over. Well, you just run up to the tree, you know, and you just, and if you're feeling a bit tired, well, guys, you just take a bite of one or two of these things and you are awake and rolling. Cause, oh, they're yummy. Mm, make your kiva. <coughs> mm, but they're delicious. They are so delicious. And you know what? It doesn't matter if you don't get them perfect. That's the most important thing that I want you to learn because you don't all. You are not all. In fact, most of us aren't one monoculture garden that we only do orange for export or Clement Gold for the special market. Guys, we do it for ourselves. And if it's got a bump and a bit of a donga and it's got something scratched it on the side, it's okay. It's okay. It's what inside that matters. Yeah. Mm, mm. Anyway. Mm. Oh. Hey oh. Okay. This is like a nice wasabi kick. You know, it's a nah. wow. Ice cream headache. Okay, who's here this morning? Come on, guys. Noreen, good morning. Mm. Oh, you live in Coxstead. Oh, Cox said, you're having open gardens. Ladies, if you hadn't decided by now, I've just announced it to the world. I am very, very happy. Get it together. Make sure you get more gardens because I want to come visit. Um, 
Sort it out. Sort it out, chickens. Um, very cold. Oh, I know. I know. When you walk on the, on the grass and the one you can say, it's like you're walking, you're walking on glass. So, yes, it's cold. Have recently moved and have lots of fruit trees. I feel quite intimidated by looking after them. No, 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 no. Here's the thing. No matter how badly you do it, no matter how badly you do it, the likelihood of you killing it is probably 0.001%. promise you. The likelihood of you not getting it perfect is 100%. The likelihood of you getting in between, which I say is not a matric pass in today's standards, whatever that is, 28 point or 14%. Um, for me, I'm saying if you're 70% of the way there, you got it, baby. You have got it. So stick with me and we're going to take you through this. Um, Tracy, good morning. Um, from Summerfelt, Durban. Yeah, and the wind is a bit chilly up there too. Pat, good morning. Uh, will it eat you grow in the Cape? Yeah. Mm -mm. <coughs> negative, negative. Mm -mm. No, you ain't going to get no light she's there, hey? But you can buy them. Mm. Um, the fruit, I mean. Look, it will live. It will live. Um, and it will probably grow. So if you're Newlands, uh, that area on the lee, that's just on the side of the mountain where it's quite protected, it's very foresty, uh, where you're not getting all that, that hammering wind. Um, yeah, you could probably grow it. Hmm. What have you got to lose? Um, uh, good morning. Who else have I got here? Soloshini, good morning. Um, need some tips on rose care. Soloshini, I can give you lots of tips on fruit trees today, but not on, on, on rose care. But uh, do you know what? If you go to the Builders blog, if you go to that, which is www.builders.co.za, and just type in roses, a whole lot of articles and a whole lot of videos are going to come up, which will give you all the tips you need on how to get your roses looking good. But of course, they're going to sleep now. Um, Leone, um, good morning. Marlene from Ashley Pine Town. Fran Terry, Terry uh, from a chilly Hilton. Oh, yeah, boy, yes. Um, Paul Nicholas, good morning from sunny but cold Cape Town. Yeah, but you've had beautiful rain, guys. I know you've had some flooding as well, um, which I am dearly, dearly heart sore about um, that there's been some major flooding in the low lying areas. Um, so, yeah, you've got to hang in there, hey? Um, hang in there, fuss bait, and help each other out. That's how it works. Um, Anna Marie, good morning from Durbanville. Um, Yolandi, uh, good morning. Who else have we got here? Carl, good morning. Um, Erica, um, I'm struggling with lemon trees. Don't worry, we're going to get to you. We're going to get to you. Lindy, right, guys, there are loads of you online, so let's just get cracking. Let's just get cracking. Okay, so if you've never tried it or you have it, or you have half a one that's hanging on there and it hasn't done anything for like five, six years, we're going to sort it out right now. So let's talk first a bit about just what, what, what are these things? What, what are these fruit trees? Are fruit trees banished to the veggie garden and the herb garden? Negative. I think the biggest paradigm shift that we need to make as gardeners is where we put the tree, where we put it. Um, it, it does not have to be in the veggie garden. Guys, it's a tree. Ah, yeah, now, now the penny's dropping. It's a tree. It just happens to have uses for us human beings. So a peach tree, an apple tree, a plum tree, a lemon tree can go in your perennial border, in your main garden beds. There's nothing stopping you. In fact, I'd encourage it. Because what is better than a lemon tree when it bursts with those blossoms? Or any of your stone fruit? I mean, that fragrance is just insane. And um, so to know that they're perfect for marketing, demarcating entrances in pots, so into a into another section of the garden. You know, we talk about these garden rooms and you either put an arch there or you've got a hedge or you want some pots. What do you put in it? 
put them in pots. We're going to get to pots a little bit later because I know you're going to ask some questions. Um, they give beautiful structure in the garden because a tree gives you height and diversity. And for those trees, fruit trees like the stone fruit, which are deciduous, of course, then during the winter months when they have no leaves, you're getting that beautiful light that will stream through into the garden. I think that's the most important message right now is that it is a tree. Okay, so let's try and find ways of weaving it into our stories, into our garden stories. What are the basics? Now, here are the basics, and this goes for everything, okay? Here are the basics. Guys, they need sun. They need lots and lots of sun, which is why when we go doing wine tasting and we're traveling in the wine lens and that, and we go into the beautiful Ceres Valley, when you come through the tunnel and you start going down, it is open and it is sunny. Right, sun. They are not grown next to the side of the house under the eaves where it only gets two hours of sun, all right? No, they need lots of sun. So that's your first thing. Either early morning or full afternoon sun or all day sun is very important. Wind, 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 wind. You'll often see when you're driving past these big orchards that they've got rows of big, big cypress trees, um, conifers or something growing, and that's a wind break, because wind affects the leaves, um, also can affect and damage the fruit. So wind is something that you need to try and eliminate. And I know for you guys, you Capetonians, you're like, oh, well, that's just impossible. No, it's not impossible, guys. Um, the way you can do that is plant it on the other side of the garden, or in its initial stages, while it's still a little young un, is pop some stakes in, in the ground and put some shade cloth around it. Not up against it. If this is my tree, you're going to go about a meter, okay, about a meter, and you're going to pop some stakes in, obviously windward side, and you put shade cloth in, not something solid. Guys, something solid, this is what happens with the wind. I'm going to show you quickly while I eat the rest. Come, come here to my whiteboard. This is what happens. And for those of you that live in townhouse complexes and that, you'll know this or you've got a big wall around your garden. Wind comes in, okay, here's your house. Here you are, um, Disty Braai, okay, and here's your fruit tree, okay, and here you are. And here's your big wall, because this is how we live. Some with razor wire, okay. What happens is this, the wind comes along, it hits this, it actually gains velocity as it hits the solid wall. Gains velocity, goes up, and then gets pushed down by the, other, by the wind that's pushing from the upper atmosphere. And then as it's coming down, what happens? Y yes, you're right. It gains speed. <laughs> it gains speed. And it comes down here and it whips through. Okay, which is why solid is not good. So... If you have got a solid wall, we're going to break it. And we're going to break it by putting some stays up and a bit of, however I'm drawing this, this is a terrible drawing, some shade cloth around it. So as it comes here, the wind hits it. And because it is not solid, um, oh, I can't stick this thing here. Because it's not solid, it actually just, it, it almost, what's the right word? It just dissipates it. It just like takes it down a few levels. Um, yeah, just kind of softens it and, and, and makes it far less aggressive, far, far less aggressive. Okay, frost is always an issue. Can I grow this? Can I grow that? Can I grow that? Guys, depending on where you live, of course, you are going to have to take this into account. Stone fruit can cope with very, very low temperatures. Okay, likewise, so can kiwi um, so can your blueberries, your blackberries, any of your berries, they can cope with that. Um, your citrus can cope with a bit. So initially, you would need to make sure that the young plants, and this is what happens, it's when they are young that they have the most susceptibility to frost. So you are going to need to protect them. Um, how you protect them, I'm going to show you a little bit later. Or maybe I should actually do that now. Because 
I think this is an important thing that everybody always asks. How, how do I keep them okay? And how, if I want to grow a granadilla, and I know that the granadilla, that we're in a frost area, and how do I look after it? How do I make sure that it doesn't get killed by the frost? Well, there are ways of getting around this. And I think it's very poignant what we're going to talk about now and what we're going to show you because it's going to talk to your whole garden, um, your entire garden, which I think is really, really important right now. So if that coleus is still hanging in there, <laughs> watch this video that's coming up now because I think you could possibly save it. As gardeners, one of our biggest kicks is being able to grow plants that actually shouldn't grow where we live. South Africa is so huge and diverse, from winter rainfall to summer rainfall to areas that get severe frost. And frost is what we want to talk about today. How do we protect the plants that are soft and tender to that to make sure that they can make it through the winter and into spring to still be there and still be able to flourish? Today I'm going to share with you four points that you need to have a look at, take care of them, use them in your garden to make sure that your plants are going to see it through the cold winter. The first point, which is probably the most important, is to use plant guard, which is known as frost cover. Now, frost cover has been around for many, many years. And in fact, if you've never used it and you have lost plants in winter, then we're about to change your life. So all it is, it's really simple to use. Pop it out the packaging. It can be reused year and year again if you look after it properly. And by that, I mean, just making sure that once you've finished using it, fold it up, pack it away where you'll remember where it is until the beginning of next winter. So this is what frost protection cover looks like. It's a very fine, thinly woven material. Um, it's almost got a candy floss like appearance. This comes in a three meter by 10 meter roll, which can then be cut up into smaller sections. Frost Guard is quite a unique product. The fact that you can place it over plants and the plants are still able to photosynthesize. So you can leave it on the entire winter. Yes, the plants will grow and you can still water them as normally around the base and they will continue to be happy. The point is that when you put this over it, it forms a little microclimate, keeping the warmth inside, the cold on the outside, and also keeping important moisture on the inside of the plant. So it really is great from wrapping up standards to putting it over frost tender plants, entire beds, or even one or two veggies, those special ones that you've got growing in the garden. A quick tip on how to keep your frost protection or frost guard in place is to take 20 to 25 centimeter lengths of soft wire, bend it over to form a U-shape, and then simply pierce it through the frost protection directly into the soil. Well guys, the frost guard is now on, and I know that this beautiful little plant, my Solenostemon, also known as Coleus, is going to be snug as a bug in a rug. Even with the strongest winds, this frost guard will be secure. Remember, at the end of winter, when there are no signs and no dangers of frost, you are quite happy to remove this, fold it up and store it away in a safe place. If your plants have been hit by frost and you come out in a couple of days later, this is the damage that you will see. The leaves will almost look burnt. Um, they will take on a yellowing appearance. Some of them will even become quite crunchy. Please, whatever you do, do not try and remedy it. Do not try and prune the plant back into some form of health. Rather leave it because in a couple of days time you could get more frost damage. So my advice, leave the plant, wait until things warm up, until spring arrives, then you can do your pruning remedy, feed the plant and allow it to continue. The second tip on how to avoid Jack Frost getting hold of your garden and your plants is to plant those susceptible plants into containers. There is no reason why you can't have lettuce in winter if you're planting them in terracotta pots or raising them off the ground. So either take the plants, have them in smaller pots, put them up onto a table, onto a windowsill, close to the courtyard, where the warmth of the house actually helps to protect the plants. And likewise, here in the veggie garden, anything can still be grown as long as it's in containers, off the ground, away from the cold. Your third tip on protecting your plants against frost is by using mulch. 
We know that mulch comes in many different forms from bark nuggets like this to your own homemade compost to lawn clippings to even leaf mulch. Place it around the plants because when doing that what you're doing is you are going to be creating a beautiful little layer which is almost going to act like an electric blanket trapping the heat into the soil and preventing the cold from getting into the plants. This layer of mulch will prove indispensable in a lot of your soft tender plants. For frost tender perennials such as begonias, whether they are the bedding plant form or one such as dragon wings, for impatience, whether it's sun patients or the New Guinea impatience, a good way to protect them is to prune them back, cover them with mulch just so that their little stems are just peeking out. They'll stay snug like that throughout the winter as spring arrives and temperatures warm up, open up the bark mulch and away they come again. Your fourth tip on frost protection is watering. Rather water your garden early in the morning so that the water can get absorbed into the garden beds, into the soil, so that by the time sunset arrives, the water is settled. In fact, watering late in the afternoon, before we have a cold evening, can generally cause a lot of damage, especially if you're using too much water. If you have had frost and you wake up early in the morning, the sun is simply rising and you see the frost on the plants, then water your garden and simply melt away the frost. And that helps reduce the damage that it's gonna cause on the plants. Remember, by having water around the plant, in other words, by watering your plants early in the morning, actually forms a little insulating layer. The water actually protects the plants. That's why it's important to pay attention to how much and when you're watering. Well, there are four tips of how to keep Jack Frost at bay. Remember, everything that I've used is available either in-store or online. Remember to visit the blog where you can see great articles and cool DIY videos to turn you into a green-fingered guru. Get to builders and get it done. No, I'm eating the last of my, of my kumquat here and drinking cold coffee. Yeah. Not advised. Not advised, but what can you do? Guys, so I hope that gives you a really good idea on gardening practices and things that you can do in your garden right now. Um, it, they, they time, they, they, they take a little bit of time, but once it's on, it's done but most importantly what it's going to do is those plants that are special to you that um, you really want to make sure that they are looked after will be there um, when summer arrives again very very important okay so let's get to the most important part which is planting guys with fruit trees with any plant there's one chance and I can never really get this message through enough. We have one chance. It's not what we call a lifetime. You know, often it's referred to as uh, we've got one chance at this life, so go and get it. You know, now, this is one chance. This is that moment when you dig the hole, you do it, you put it in, and it's done. That determines the outcome or the altitude or the success of that plant in that moment. And I cannot stress that enough. Um, yes, the other things that you can do, which we're going to talk about just now, about the pruning and the, and the things, but get it right, right in the beginning. And if you are prepared to spend 200 rand, 300 rand, 50 rand, I don't know, on a tree, then treat it and give it the due respect that it that it needs in order to get it going. So, so what do we need, guys? What do we need? Okay, um, stay there. I'm going to just grab my my secateurs here because they. So, let's just let's just do pots. Let's get that out the way because I am often asked. I've got a lemon tree. It's been growing in a pot for four years, and I still don't have a lemon. Okay, the first thing I will ask you is how big is the pot? Nine times out of 10, the pot is about this big. Now, if you can't get an idea on how big this is, um, I'm gonna give you, that's a pair of secateurs. So 
Do you see that? It's not even two secateurs high. So there it is. It's, it's not even two secateurs high, and it is not even two secateurs wide. Negative. That is not sufficient. Okay, so the biggest thing in, in container fruit trees is that the pots are normally too small. Okay, the pots. Um, it's really, really very, very important that you either buy the pot one month and then you buy the fruit tree the next month so that you can, um, you can then make sure that you've got it all right. So this is the size and nothing smaller than this that I recommend. So let's take a look. It's a really big, beautiful terracotta pot. I've got one, two and a half secateurs. Two and a half secateurs wide. Okay, and in heart, I've got one just over there, just, just one three quarters, so two, but you can see it's wide. And that's what's important with fruit trees because most fruit trees, their feeder roots are all on the surface. So none of these like, uh, 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 those, you know those tall, narrow, you know, the, you know that pot, you know the, that, that shape pot, the urn, near, near, near. Rather put a pansy in there or something, but do not go and put your fruit tree inside there. Um, okay, so pots, that's it. Importantly as well, that remember in pots you're going to have to feed more and you're going to have to water more. Um, so with any fruit tree in a container, a minimum, a minimum of once a week, a minimum. And when I mean water, I mean water. And you want to water that, not this pss, 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 you know, not that, like, not that. You, you really, you want to put your, if you're watering with the, with the spray nozzle um, on your hose pipe, you want to put it on one of the lowest, and you really want to just get it around there and let it just soak through, just soak through. Um, you might have seen in some of these, um, on, on some of the, the online videos where they're actually smaller containers, they actually have a bigger container full of water and they take the whole pot and they put it in and you see the bubbles blop, 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 blop coming through. Okay, because that means that it's been drenched properly. Of course, it's a bit difficult to do that with a big pot, but that's what I'm trying to get to is that it needs a really, really good watering. Um, not just water till it comes out the bottom because water, ah, yes, water, like you saw in the floods in the Cape and last year in KZN, takes its quickest route and its easiest route. So if there are gaps in there, it's going to find it out and go out. And you're going to think, ah, oh, my watering is done and dusted. But actually, you haven't drenched it. Okay, so real good drenching. In containers, guys, crocs, which are, I love using. That's where terracotta pots but had a crack in it. I dropped it on the floor. Um, I take these. You can also use a little piece of um, shade cloth that you cut. And that goes, not to cover the hole, guys, not to cover it. But what you're doing is, do you see, I'm going to put it like, do you see, like that. And then I'm going to build like a little, a little castle around there. Do you, you see what's happening there? I am not covering it. Very importantly, I am simply, I, I'm, I'm allowing still enough, enough flow and enough movement for drainage to happen because fruit trees hate wet feet. And so do you. They hate wet feet, which is often why you will see in the farmlands and where they're growing fruit trees, like on mass, is that they're actually grown on a berm. Yeah, you've seen that and you've thought, why on earth did they do that? They're like growing on this like mountain because of drainage, purely because of drainage. Okay, so let's get down to planting. Um, guys, importantly this, and I'm going to whiz through this because some of you might know this, um, but I'm going to whiz through it and you're going to get the basics. Right, here we go. You are going to dig a hole, a nice, very big hole, okay. You're going to dig your hole at least double the size of the bag, the width, double the depth. Good, got that, okay, there's your hole. The soil that you remove from the top, you're going to take and put one side, if it's good, okay. If it's good, how do you know that it's good? Well, it's got good consistency. Um, it's got a good coloration. It smells good. So we're going to put that on the side. That's what we call topsoil. Okay. This stuff at the bottom, normally when you start going down in the layers, ha, oh, you start hitting clay. You start hitting stones, all sorts of other things. That, you take that and you, hoi, vach. Okay. 
throw it away. All right? What you do now is you are going to use an entire bag of compost. And sometimes you might need two bags of compost. And if you can't afford the bag of compost, don't buy the fruit tree. Finished. Okay, because we're giving it its best chance here. So, right, compost onto the pile. Right, bump, bump, okay. Onto that, you're going to add bone meal or superphosphate. You are then going to add one or two handfuls of fertilizer. Now, here, guys, your options are open, okay? Um, come along with me, Mason, and let's just actually show the folks what you can use here. You can use organic Vita Boost, which has got earthworm castings in it. So this, you can use at least two handfuls in it. You can use Wonder 232, all right? That also will give it a really good start. Um, there's some organic options just along here. You can use some Bio Ocean, two or three handfuls. Of course, bone meal, there it is. You can never overuse bone meal, so go wild. Um, and of course, you could also use some 315 organic into the planting hole. But what I would encourage you to do is, most importantly, do not forget to put the bone meal, the superphosphate, or you're going to use something called Root Builder. Okay, all three of these products available at your local builders. Put it in, okay, whatever you do. Now you've got it all over here, okay, and then you're going to mix. Mix, 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 mix it all up. If you have got a heavy clay soil, if you've got a heavy clay soil, at the bottom, I want you to put some rocks. Okay, what kind of rocks? Gravel. That blue, big 19 mil builder stone that you can buy per bag at builders. Get that, rinse it. Okay, because sometimes it's full of dust. Rinse it, put that at the bottom of the hole if you've got bad drainage. Then you put some of this stuff in to get our right level. Then you place your fruit tree in. Remember, we want the neck of the tree to be just at the same level of the original soil level of the nursery bag or pot that you bought it in. Very important. Very, very important. Then you put the stuff back. And then we create what we call a little berm, okay, a little berm. And we do that so that when we water, the water doesn't run away. Very, very important, okay. Then it comes to staking, okay, staking. And now, guys, there are many options of staking. And um, I'm going to show you very, very quickly. When we... When we buy our fruit trees, and I'm going to use an example. Yeah, let's take this guy over here. Um, so, oh, amma. there we go. What do we have here? We want an orange. Oh, yeah, we got an orange. So, it's got a stake in it. Okay, but when we plant, this is pretty useless, in my opinion. They normally come with these little wooden things. They, they, they really are, guys, that they... If you if you planted before, you'll know that they fall over, that, that something happens. So I normally take this, and the easiest way to actually get rid of it is this, and just hang tight with me. Just let me get rid of this stupid little tie up here, and I'm just going to cut it off. Normally they are held with, this is quite impressive, the tie that they've used here. Um, normally they've held with some tape, but what I always do is I just take it, and I do that, and I just break it off, okay, because it is of no use to man or beast. Um, get yourself a good steak. Um, these, I really, really like these. They're lightweight. You can cut them to the right height with a hacksaw. Um, you can use some bamboo for smaller plants, or you actually get a dropper. Get a, a nice, thick, sturdy um, CCA-treated dropper. Okay, and then you are going to put it in not too close. You see, look here, I'm not doing that. It's not too close. Come in here and have a look. Not too close, very, very important, that you put it just slightly away. Okay, probably about five centimeters. Okay, you want to guide it in, right, guide it into the tree. So you're going to guide it in. Okay, right, there we go. Right, there it is. Okay, nice and straight. Then what's important, and this is my little box of tricks 
that I have. And you'll notice it is everything inside here. Guys, there's one of these ties. So you can use one of these. You pick them up. Also, you go down to that section where all the little hand tools in that are. Lots of, lots of these things you're going to find. This is a rubber tie. You've got some of this. If you are going to be using any wiring, guys, please make sure that it is the round one. Okay? The round, round one, not the flat one. Make sure that it's the round one. That's plastic coated. Okay? Very important. Good old stockings. Okay? In here as well. I've got some of those things. Um, yeah, those things. I've got some um, weed guard that can also work. And let's actually just show you how it works because we often use weed guard in the, um, in the veggie garden. And um, I'll show you how nicely it does work. So you're just going to cut a strip of it. Of course, you could use um, hessian as well. Does the job equally. Um, so, but what's important is that you do it properly. Okay, so let's just do this here. But this is my little bo box of tricks. And guys, if you don't have one little Tupperware container for your box of tricks, I strongly urge you to, because I guarantee you, when you're looking for that thing that you bought, you can't find it. You're digging everywhere. So the most important thing when you are going to be tying is that we tie, we go around it, we do a figure of eight, you see, I've gone across it there, crossed it, and then I come back round, and then I tie it. What is this doing? It means that if the wind is blowing and the tree moves, imagine if I tied it, and I'm going to show you with one of these things, just to show you how it works. Um, so come up here with me. Imagine if I tied this like that. Okay, can you see that, if I tied it like that? The wind is going to blow, this branch is going to rub against here. It's going to rub. It's going to rub, and look what happens. Okay, scars. When that happens, that's when you get weaknesses in the plant. That's when you get extra strong wind. It's going to nail the scar. And of course, diseases. Okay, so that is time and staking. Get it right, guys, and do it properly, please. Now, before I lose anything out of my box of tricks, I'm just going to put my lid back on it. And I don't know about in your house, but in this household, lids, there's a lid thief. True story, there's a lid thief. Because if I go looking for a lid for a Tupperware, it are gone. It is disappeared. Okay, so I believe there's some questions here, so let's get on to it, um, guys. And let's have a look at how we can help you here. So let's go over here. Right, 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 right. And um, good morning. My lemon tree is in a pot. It's about a meter and four years old, but does not bear fruit nor flowers. Areas Kruger's Dorb. Right. First thing, um, Khadija, how big is the pot? First thing. Second thing, how often are you watering? Are you watering it enough? Certainly in summer, I would be watering twice a week. Good deep watering. And are you giving it food? Food. Because remember, fruit trees, whether they're in a pot or whether they're in the ground, need nutrition. So let's cover that right now while we're talking about it. Nutrition is so, so important. I spoke to you about what you use for planting. I'm going to tell you very quickly what you use for fruiting. When do you fertilize? For your citrus. You would do one just a good fertilizing just before spring, okay? So um, any time from the middle of July onwards, you can do your first fertilizing. Then you can do again um, September, and then you do again in November. And then your last good fertilizing is in autumn, okay? There's so many things that you can use out there, guys, from the organic Vita Boost to fruit and flowers, um, which is an organic pelletalized fertilizer, Bio Ocean, which has also got seaweed in it, and of course your 315 Organic. They all do the job. Follow the instructions on the bag because that will tell you how much to put on. And remember, when you're fertilizing, you also got to fertilize in a pot. Okay, let's just come back to the pot. Um, I'm going to do this. When you are fertilizing in a pot, 
and this is your tree, okay? And let's pretend that this is my fertilizer. This is what most humans do. We put it around there. Let's actually do it like this. How am I going to show you this very nicely? Um, let's do this. Okay, there it's in the pot. Pretend this is my fertilizer. We do that. We put it around it like that in a neat little, little arrangement. <laughs> Guys, it must go all over. You make sure that you distribute your fertilizer all around. And wherever your last leaves are, so say this was the pot and or if, say this was the ground and my fruit tree is in the ground and my last leaf, my branch, is over here, okay, is over there. This area from there to here is what we call the drip zone. That's the drip zone. That's where, ah, remember I was telling you about those lovely leaves, okay, um, about those beautiful, uh, not the leaves, the roots, about those beautiful roots that come out the surface roots, this entire area from here to here. And I can even draw it for you to make it easier. Um, so here, fruit tree, okay, ground, leaves, leaves, there. Do you see that? From there to there is what we call the drip zone or your root zone. So your fertilizing needs to happen from here to there. Ah, oh, oh. Yeah, you've got a lot of fertilizing to do, guys. You have got a lot to do. And of course, mulch. You've seen me hanging around here and fiddling around with, with all of these. Guys, just like any plant, fruit trees are no different. Um, it's really important that you do put a protective layer around them. What does that do? Well, you saw in the video that it helps with frost. This over here, oh, this is, this, these are just, this is almost half composted. So. This here is what we've put through the, the chipper. Um, so it's, it's one of those, those chippers that you know you plug in and you push through the, um, the bits. Uh, really, I, I could not live, I, I don't think I could exist without my shredder. Um, and the important thing is to put the material through the shredder when it's green. Don't wait for it to lie there and get, um, and get all dry because then whoa, it becomes quite a job. And so put your material through and you get this beautiful stuff. We then pack that into piles and turn it every now and then and water it. And look what's happening here. Look what we end up with. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Now imagine this as a good thick layer around your plant. Beautiful stuff. I mean, geez, it, even, it smells good. Of course... We've all got a lot of these leaves. You can also put those around and you will notice that as I go further down, because we pulled this out of one of our black bags, um, you can see it's almost starting to compost already. Do you see that? Um, now, if you want to learn how to make your own leaf mulch um, or leaf, what do we call it? What is it? Oh, leaf mold, that's the right word. If you want to know how to make your own leaf mold, this stuff turns, ha, oh, this guys, <laughs> this is like uh, magic, Ching! leaves, when you put them into a black bin bag, go onto the builder's website, go onto the, and, and go onto the, 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 the playlists where um, the videos are and search leaf mold, wow, your life is about to be changed. Okay, great, let's get to the next question over here. Um, where are we, where are we, where are we, where are we, let's have a look. Um, so the bottom line is, with that lemon tree, water, fertilizing, it needs food. What is the right time to treat for fruit fly? Very, very good question, very good question. Okay, guys, so the way to demonstrate this is I'm going to use, um, just to give you an idea on size. So if you've any, 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 um, fruit tree, whether it's citrus, um, whether it's your stone fruit, when the fruit gets the size of a, of a marble, or just slightly smaller, this is actually a coffee tree, yeah, coffee, coffee, like, like, like the coffee that you drink, um, because inside here, they're the beans, they're the coffee beans, um, yeah, and you could give it a bash, um, and that's what the tree looks like, isn't it, Nunu? And you know, it makes a really good indoor plant as well. 
because they come from the jungles. They come from the tropical jungles, so they can also take quite low light. One of the strange fruit trees that can actually grow in quite a lot of shade. So when it becomes marble size, that's when you need to start treating for fruit fly. Because it's at that point when it'll come around um, and she will then pierce the fruit, lay her eggs as the fruit is developing, so the larva goes through its different stages, hee hee, and just when you're about to bite into your beautiful nectarine or apple, well you do bite into it and then you see, you know, Wally the worm, like also, like, like what is going on here because you've just disturbed his beautiful habitat. Um, there are many options at your local builders for dealing with fruit fly. You can do traps, um, you can spray with organic products, um, but they are out there for you to use, guys. And just on another point, because I know I'm going to get asked it, is what else can go wrong? And I'm going to deal with that very, very quickly. In terms of diseases, um, oh, wait, okay. I, I, I'm going to get there now. And this is especially for Duran. Duran says, my citrus tree has a white powder-like bug under the leaves. You're on the money, boy, because I'm going to show you exactly what's cooking there. So this is what you have here. Have a look here. But you've got to come in really, really close here. You can see it like a, a powdery stuff. It's like fluffy, like cotton woolly. And that is called mealy bug. Now, when you have mealy bug, you're generally going to have a few other things. You're going to have these bumps on the leaves. Can you see those bumps? Those bumps are known as citrus cilla. And you are also going to have an ant or two. I promise. Ah, oh, there it is. There it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where are you? Where are you? I saw you. I saw you a second ago. Did you drop? Okay. No, man. You were here. Am I seeing things? Guys, he was here. Okay. You're going to have ants. Uh, so, because what happens is, so the bumps are something called cilla. Citrus cilla. I'm still looking for the ant. Citrus cilla. That is a winged insect that comes along and beds itself, sucks out the juice, makes these little, little pits, okay, which you see, and actually the damage is underneath. So if you turn the leaf upside down here, you can actually see them. There they are, those little dots, those little brown things. That is the cilla. All right, how do you get rid of that? You can spray with an organic insecticide. You can spray with oleum. You can spray with eco insect spray. Um, you can spray with organocide. Um, either of those will do it. Remember, folks, that there are products out there that have long, long lasting effects. But, and here's the but. What it does mean is that you aren't able to eat that fruit, okay, for at four to five months. So, Please always read the instructions on the labels on, on what you're about to buy. Uh, when you have killed the cilla, okay, the bumps will remain okay, until the next set of growth. So for that, I always recommend preventative spraying, especially on your new foliage. When it has a flush, when you have a flush of new leaves, guys, just spray with an organic insecticide. Um, don't spray the flowers, okay, because you want the bees to come and you don't want to put a garlic smell on the flowers because then you're going to confuse the pollinators and they're not going to go to the flowers. So don't spray the flowers, spray the leaves. But I told you about the ants because you will have ants if you're going to have that fluffy stuff because together with the, with the citrusilla you're also going to get aphids and you're going to get scale and you're going to get mealy bug. So you've got to get rid of the ants. And one of the easiest ways to get rid of ants, and I'm still looking for an ant, Tinny, it's going to be the death of me, this thing. Where'd you go? Anyway, never mind that. Okay, to get rid of the ants, one of the easiest and quickest, quickest ways to do it, and as a preventative measure, so that you don't actually have to get out any big bazooka sprays, is if this is your, your tree, this is your lemon tree, your fruit tree, guys, get that stocking that I told you about, wrap the stocking around the base, and put a thick layer of Vaseline on it. Thick layer, yeah, petroleum jelly. Thick layer of Vaseline. Not shea butter, not coconut Vaseline, just ordinary Vaseline. 
thick layer of that because you'll find, because ants can't fly. No. They climb up the stem. But when they get to the Vaseline, they can't go over it. And when you remove that, when you eliminate that, you eliminate so many other pests and diseases. Just like that. Okay, nice and easy. And all you've got to do is remember to have your jelly around. Have your, have your um, petroleum jelly. And then you just put a thick layer of there and you'll watch them. It's the most delightful experience. I promise you that. You watch them going up there and they're like, dude, what's going on here? Okay, uh, you'll also... I'm taking you back on your road trips when you go past big orchards you'll see some of them actually have like a cone around the base and you can get those um, these big cones that almost sit and they face downwards so that when the little ho ho comes up it, it can't go further so it's it's called a, a collar um, but if you get rid of the ants and you spray when you have your first flush you're generally going to be in the clear Okay, last thing I want to talk about very, very quickly is pruning. Um, and guys, pruning is, is very, very important. And we prune for several reasons. We prune to shape. We prune to allow airflow. Because if we have airflow, we have less chance of diseases. Airflow also means light. If we have more light, we'll have more flowers. If we have more flowers, we'll get more fruit. Please just bear in mind, if you have planted your fruit tree and it starts to produce fruit this season, I know it's hard guys, I know it's hard, but I would remove the fruit. Remove the fruit and rather let the plant put that energy into growth. And you know sometimes people will phone me and they'll say, or they'll email and say, Tanya, I had an amazing crop last year, and this year I've got nothing. Do you know why? We stress the plant out. So when you go to your fruit trees and you examine them, and there's like, especially in your, in your lemons, let's just, or let's just take this kumquat. Um, and this should have been done when it was smaller. Okay? So lots and lots of fruit. But if when it was pea size, so it's about three to four weeks after flowering, you see clusters, I would remove at least half of the fruit. Especially with things like narches and citrus and, and um, um, grapefruit. All of your stone fruit, remove it when it is young. Rather let the plant put this energy into leaf growth. Because after heavy cropping, the plant is, is exhausted. And you'll find it won't put on enough foliage to prepare it for the next season, which means you'll have a bad crop the following season. Okay, very important. So, yeah, you, you've got to like, you gotta, you gotta like hold back. You gotta be cruel to be kind. And so thin it out, very, very much thin it out. When it comes to, to all your citrus, your citrus basic pruning, and we've done a couple of videos on this guys, is more about just thinning, so thinning, not heavy pruning, but thinning to allow more light in. You most certainly can reduce height, okay? But remember, wherever you reduce height, and if I'm cutting a long branch that's out there, wherever I cut it, I'm then going to get two branches emerging. So that's what you need to consider. So thinning out every alternative really does work, especially in citrus. Your stone fruit is something slightly different. And with citrus and stone fruit, I want to come down to this. Do you see this part here? This is called the graft. You can see it. You can see where it's happened here. So this part of our, what is this, of our pear was grafted onto this. This is where a good genetics, a good cropping variety, a part of that plant was taken and infused onto a root that is tough, disease resistant, and um, is able to hold the plant effectively. But looking at this fruit tree, guys, we've got some problems going on here. We've got some serious problems. And that's why it's so important to do the training in your first season. So if this was my fruit tree and I'm looking at it, the first thing I would do, and pruning needs to happen now, during June, first two weeks of July, for 
your um, deciduous fruit. So first of all, these two little twiggy things here must go, okay? These little twiggy things must go. All twiggy little small things need to get out of here, all right? <coughs> this is actually, <laughs> I chose quite a beast here. Um, because guys, this is going to have to be drastic. It's going to have to be drastic. And, and I'm going to tell you why. Because with all stone fruit, um, and in fact, even on your citrus, you want one leader. You want one main stem. You don't want a crooked stem because it's going to compromise the tree when it gets older. So you know what I'm going to have to do here. Hey? We want to choose one leader. Whew. I'm getting my beggar sick of tears. Hang five. Um, because we are going to do this. And don't gasp and make all sorts of noises now. Because I'm actually going to save this tree. Um, so I am removing that. And I am then going to remove this. Okay. Come on, get buddy. Get in there. And I'm going to remove this here. Okay. And then let's get in here. I can get rid of this over here. But you want one main leader. You could imagine what would happen to this guy if he was left here. It's going to be a disaster. Oh, and you see, it's already happening here. Do you see this crossing when you're pruning? Okay, any fruit trees. Do you see where this branch is crossing this branch? Let's say this was off your main leader. You want to remove one. Pick a lane, but you don't want cross branches. So I would just do that. There, look at that. More air coming through there immediately. Okay, no cross branches. Now, okay, so we've done that. Okay, you've all got a breath. You've all taken a breath. If you'll stop gasping, you want to then remove one third, okay, one third of your top growth. You can go down to about 90 centimeters. For me, I would go down to a beautiful outward facing bud here. There he is. Do you see that? Look at him. Look at that nice outward facing bud. It's strong. Do you see that? Strong bud. Okay, and I would do this. Right. Now my fruit tree can grow. Because now what's going to happen is we are going to get some side branches here. Because remember I said wherever you prune, you are going to get lower branches or it's going to fork. So this is going to be your header, which you will always cut back every year. Because we want a vase shape. We want that. So ideally what we're looking for is this to do that, which will happen. Okay, and another guy to... He is going to do that. That's what's going to happen. You got the picture. Can you see it? Okay, you can see it happening. Because then we've got that beautiful vase shape. When it comes to then pruning, the following year, what you would then do is remove this long one down just by a third, bringing it back down to a third. So obviously, the taller your tree gets, the bigger your tree, your tree gets, the third becomes less, you know, because if it's a good few years old. If you have got old trees, old citrus, and they're just doing nothing, guys, I will prune it right back down. Prune it. Hit it right back down. Just not below the graft. Okay? Just not below the graft. And another way, I want to show you just another way to identify what the graft looks like. Sometimes they put a bit of paint on it. Okay? And this is also for their identification because, you know, when you've got a whole lot of bare-rooted um, fruit trees, it's really difficult to see. And look up here, normally just above there. There it is. Can you see that? You can see the scar. That's what we want. So if you've got a very, very old fruit tree, look for where that scar is and cut it. And then start the process like I've just explained. But guys, if you still haven't got all of this and you're still a bit worried and you've got questions, don't fear. When you pop along to your local builders, remember you can always pick up an issue of the gardener or detainee. Here they are. Oh, look at those beautiful magazines. Look at them. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, when you have learned, looked at this article, you're going to run out and hello your garden. Hello, hello. They are, guys, they are so spectacular. Um, uh, this season's aloes just seem to have been beyond. The birds are going mental in our garden 
be inspired. Um, there's a great article on dry shade as well, which so many of us have in our gardens. And of course, if you're still worried about your fruit trees, get a copy of Grow to Eat magazine. This Grow to Eat takes you from autumn right through into winter. So it gives you the moon calendar. It gives you what to plant, what to sow. It also tells you, ha ha, fruit trees that are not producing fruit and you've got them and how do you deal with them so it's all here guys ready for you to jump in and indulge remember also that if you're needing more more because we always want more um pop along to the builders website because there are loads of great videos there and educational clips and blogs um, that'll keep you on the right track oh and importantly guys we start our road shows again I am so excited. Yes, uh, we are starting our road shows. Um, our first one is on the 29th of July at Builders Warehouse Erasmus Park. Guys, it's a date. Come on, come on. I want to see you there. Um, 29th, uh, for more details, check out the Builders Facebook page um, and also my Facebook page and the Gardeners. Uh, we'll be reminding you about it way before the time. So just put all day busy. Very, very busy. Um, guys, I know we've rushed through it. Um, it's a big topic. Uh, but if you've got any questions, um, shoot them to us and we'll get back to you on them. Uh, stay warm. Uh, look after yourselves. Look after your fruit trees because you never know what you can get handed. God bless you all. And most importantly, happy gardening.